Hey everybody, it's a Saturday night and we're going to take a trip around the world here. Uh, my last video I was asked if I could point out the gallon size of each of the tanks as I go around. Apparently I've not been mentioning that. This of course is my 29 miscellaneous, so called, because it is my 29 gallon tank. And it's had random fish in it over the years and that's what's never really had a theme or anything. And therefore it's just my 29 miscellaneous. Not really a lot to report on this week. Uh, everything is still going well. All eight of the long fin black skirt tetras that I put in there, um, I don't know, a month, month and a half, two months ago, something like that. Uh, all of them have survived. I haven't had a single loss, so that's good news. I'm happy about that. It is about time to get in there and do a water change. Nothing major is going on. I did add some eggshells to this tank recently. You can see a few little white specks down near the bottom. Um, those eggshells have not dissolved. I think there might have been some confusion on some people's parts uh, and when they were discussing it. The eggshells have simply just worked their way down into the substrate. They're just little small broken up pieces and therefore work their way down between the chunks of gravel and are out of sight. They're still in the tank though. They don't dissolve that quickly. Uh, I know we got the glare from the crab tank on the floor below us right now. But if you can see some of that uh, white stuff right here be able to see much looking at that glare but the little bits and pieces of white flecks you can see down there are what's left of the eggshells visible above the surface it'll take about a year before they really break down and dissolve into the water and i need to get in there and actually replace the eggshells uh, i also wanted to point out i don't know how well you can see it or not but there is a piece of water sprite growing right up out of the little feeding hole in my hood so while i'm in there doing a water change i'm probably going to get in there and pull some of that water sprite out of there don't forget i do have water sprite for sale i've got a bucket full of the stuff so check out my email below if you're interested in any plants and contact me and we can talk about getting something going with that so not a lot going on in there as i said moving on to my garami tank this one is 55 gallons I did add some neons to this tank recently. I took them out of my quarantine tank and I added a few more um, peppered corys. Couldn't think of what they were called for a minute there. I could think of the real name, the Corydoras palliatus, but I could not think of peppered cory. So I added a few more peppered corys in there. I think I have three or four of them in there now. I've got a significant school of neons. I've got probably about a dozen neons. And the other thing I wanted to point out with this tank is I'm losing one of my loaches. It's kind of hard to see down there in the corner if my camera will ever focus on it. But it looks really rough and it's been getting rougher and rougher for the last couple of months. It's color starting to fade. It's starting to get thinner and thinner. It's becoming more and more listless. So, don't really know what to make of that. It's been in the tank for probably close to five years now. And it just started, it's looking like it's fading away after years and years of being in this tank. So, I don't know if that would be old age or not. I've got a few others that are in the tank. I originally started with eight once upon a time. But I'm down to, I think, four now. Including that one. So the other ones all look good. They all look nice and flat, uh, fat and full body. They've got good color. And I looked up the age, you know, the life expectancy of them, and it's five to seven years. So that, you know, it is falling within the normal category of the life expectancy of a skunk loach. You know, when you read five to seven years, it doesn't mean every single one always lives to five to seven years. It's the same way with the maximum size of fish. You know, when you think about uh, other animals, you think of dogs, there might be a 20, 30 pound difference between a big type of a certain dog and a smaller, you know, same species, same breed, same everything. Just some are big and some aren't quite so big. And the same applies with fish. You know, you get some really big specimens and some really small specimens that all fall within that same normal uh, parameters. So having three of them that still look good and healthy at five years old doesn't mean one of them at five years old isn't coming to the end of its life just because that particular fish isn't going to live to be an old fish. 
I don't know what else to make of it. Like I said, it's nothing really else going on in the tank. I haven't made any changes. Um, there's no reason to believe that this fish has developed some sort of parasite or something like that. I don't really know what else to chalk it up to other than the old age. So that's pretty much all that's going on in this tank that I can think of anyway. My T-bar tank, another 55-gallon tank that I have to stand far away from because I've got stuff behind me or I gotta stand too close to rather because I've got stuff behind me nothing really going on in here this week I did add a little plant right there you can kinda see the little green shoot coming out I uh, wanna say it's an Aponagetan if I was given the pronunciation correctly on that I think it's related to a water lily and I put two of them in my 125 and I put one in here so we'll see how that works out I don't really have a lot of plant eating fish in this tank but my t-bar likes to dig so he might wind up digging that up and we'll have to see how that works out my snails have been in here doing what looks like breeding behavior and I've been checking above the water line along the glass and I've not yet seen anything that doesn't mean it's not up there somewhere uh, I just haven't seen any that's clearly visible around the front edges of the tank. I haven't pulled the hood off and looked inside that closely yet. But uh, I haven't seen anything front and center as far as snail eggs going on in this tank. So I'm not too concerned about that. I do need to get in there and trim the remains of the flowers off of my um, Anubius plants here. They're way done past their prime and they need to just get cut off. I just haven't bothered to get in there and doing it. It's the equivalent of just deadheading a flower. So it's not like it's going to be difficult or challenging. I just have to get in there and do it. I also want to point out, if you can see the little tufts of algae that grow on the edge of this Anubius. Let me try to zoom in on one of them. You can see those little tufts of algae. I think that is blackbeard algae, but I'm not 100% sure. I've always sort of thought that that kind of tufted algae, that's where it got its name. It's that dark color, and it sort of grows along the edges of leaves like that. If that is blackbeard algae, I've been asked how I deal with it and how I get rid of it. And my answer is, I don't know. I just, that's, it never really gets beyond that. I don't know if it's the plecos that are in here. I have a high fin spotted pleco and I have a clown pleco in here or possibly a rubber lip. I always forget which one it is uh, unless I'm looking at it. It's either a clown pleco or a rubber lip. And then I've got one of the high fin spotted plecos that they sell at PetSmart. And you can see this tank stays fairly algae free. Here's another good example of a lot of that stuff. See how it grows right along the edge of the leaf and little black tufts. You can even see some in the leaves behind it in the background there, the same kind of stuff growing. So I don't know if that's being kept under control or if that's how it grows. If that's how it grows, I'm not worried about it. I, that doesn't bother me at all. I didn't even really notice it was there until somebody had asked about it and I got to kind of thinking about it. So I'd uh, like your comments below about that. If you've got any experience with blackbeard algae or you know, you know, if that's that what that is or that's not what it is or whatever, by all means, go down below and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Other than that, I can't think of anything else to talk about with this tank. So we're going to move on to my black ghost knife fish tank. This tank is a 40 breeder. It is three feet wide, but it's 18 inches deep. And I want to say it's 20 inches tall. I really like the size of this tank. The only problem is getting hoods to find it. If you ever get yourself a 40 breeder, you're going to have a nightmare trying to find a hood that fits it properly. And you're going to pay a lot of money for it. If you want an open top tank, the 40 breeder is fantastic. It's got a nice big footprint, so you've got a lot of space to look down in. And, of course, if you've got an open top and you've got plants growing up and out the top of it, again, it's a nice big open tank for you to use for those purposes. And if you're willing to pay to get the hood on it, it's likewise, it's a nice big tank and it's got a lot of depth. The fish can swim, you know, away from you significantly, whereas with the 55s, they tend to just kind of swim back and forth, you know. This gives you a little bit more of that three-dimensional um, you know, aquatic world sort of feel with that 18 inch depth to the tank. And when I say depth, I mean back to front. I don't mean um, top to bottom. I don't mean how tall it is. I mean how far back it goes. 
otherwise nothing going on in this tank which is why i'm not really talking about it and just you know pointing the camera at it to give everybody a look at it for a few minutes the last thing i did to this tank was i adjusted this cave this is where my black ghost knife fish lives and since i've adjusted it i still see him in there most of the time actually now that i'm looking around we can see his tail sticking out right now let's see if we can get it on camera you see that little white spot back there that's his tail sticking out well he must know i've got the camera zoomed in on it because he just tucked it back inside that little cave now so he doesn't like the fact that i boogered up his cave for so long i thought that cave was so small and so tiny everybody kept telling me i needed to make it bigger and he was outgrowing it and as soon as i rearranged it he left and he now hides over here he doesn't like that cave wide open like that so he's still in there and he's still doing okay but he still hides all the time he's no less reclusive and basically you know like i said i just kind of wrecked his house and he's got a new place to live now so other than that nothing else going on in this tank we will move on to my 125 gallon native tank likewise nothing really going on in this tank the plants growing here are getting pretty thick and out of control so i'm probably going to be getting in there and cleaning some of them out on my next water change i assumed that the tilapia would eat them and I'd never have to worry about the plants getting, you know, on top of me in this tank because the tilapia would eat them faster than they could grow. And that's quite obviously not the case. I've got a lot of the plants. The tilapia, of course, is this guy back here. And this fish's attitude has really changed since I moved him back into this tank. He was really outgoing and aggressive when he was in this tank originally. I got the bright idea to move him to my African tank or my 125. It's an African-themed tank. And he did great in there for a little while. And as he got a little bit bigger, he started getting an attitude and getting nasty and aggressive with my other fish. And he was really aggressive at feeding time. And so I decided that even though this is a native North American tank, you know, I'm not married to it being a biotope. So I don't mind having a little oddball fish in here once in a while. And this is certainly a cool one to have in here. And man, once I brought him back and put him in this tank, he remembers that you know ordeal of getting caught in that net he remembers being brought back into this tank he's never trusted me since then it always hides whenever i open the lid it's not really aggressive at feeding time and it seldom does anything more than just kind of hang out in the corner by itself maybe it was a you know maybe it was so outgoing and active in the other tank because there was other fish in there for it to be aggressive with maybe in this tank it just feels like it's the king of the castle and doesn't have to worry about anything all it's got is these little minnows and all it does is ignore them so i don't know still haven't gone down and done any more cray fishing i did put a few in the tank the other day i don't know if i've talked about that since i did that but there are two or three little crayfish that have gone in um since the beginning of this season i've not yet seen them since they've gone in so i don't really have anything to say about them i have no update whatsoever since they've been in this tank i'm assuming they're still in there I haven't seen any dead crayfish, I haven't seen any pieces of crayfish, but I haven't seen any living crayfish either. But I'll tell you what I can see right now, you see how this little hole sort of has opened up underneath this rock and you can see some rocks kicked around. That shows me that there's probably in all likelihood there's a crayfish living in there. That seems very much like a crayfish house. So chances are at least one of them is still in there doing well and I'm assuming they probably all are. Again, they're just in there hiding, and we haven't seen them. We're going to need to get a fair amount of them in there, and then they'll become more active and start moving around a lot more. So, moving on. My snail tank is just loaded with snails. All those little spots and specks you can see are all baby snails, and then, of course, there's snail eggs everywhere. So, once I finally got that planaria out of this tank, my snail population has exploded. Uh, I used to actually have trouble breeding snails because the planaria worms that were in the tank were eating the eggs faster than they could hatch. And so whereas most people have trouble, you know, with snail population explosions, I was not able to get them to grow. I was throwing handfuls of food in the tank and I was never getting ahead of myself with snails. So now that the planaria is out of there, I've got lots of snails for my puffers again. Well, I should say my puffer. I've actually only got the one at the moment. My gudgeon tank, this is another 40 breeder, 
And this one's very sparsely populated. I've got the purple spotted gudgeon. It's a northern purple spotted gudgeon as far as I know. I think the southern purple spotted gudgeons are actually kind of rare. Uh, I'm not 100% certain on that, but I'm pretty sure it's a northern uh, purple spotted gudgeon, which are the more common variety. I also have in the far left, down there, buried under the roots of the java, is a South American bumblebee catfish. And then I've got a rubber lip pleco that's either hiding under these little caves off here to the left or hiding under these little caves off here to the right. And that's it. That's all I've got in this tank. So it's doing pretty well since I got it cleaned up. I used some ChemiClean aquarium treatment, got all the grunge out of there. Um, got the tank looking nice again. Now all I got to do is get in and just wipe the front glass down when I do another water change. And other than that, the tank is just ticking over nicely and looking good. I'd still like another fish in here. I just don't know what to put in here to go with that gudgeon. I used to have the T-bar in this tank. And even though the T-bar was big enough that it didn't get bothered, like as far as being eaten, that gudgeon was aggressive and I used to see marks and scrapes and stuff on the side of the T-bar from that gudgeon bothering it. And if you'll remember not too long ago when I had that red tail loach in here, which by all means probably would have just minded its own business if left alone, I can only assume it was this gudgeon that was going and being the antagonist and was winding up getting itself injured in the process. So I don't really know what I can put in there with that gudgeon that wouldn't be problematic at some point so you know this tank always has the possibility of becoming uh, more interesting but in the meantime it's basically just a big green garden with the fish that kind of sits in the bottom like that so moving on my 125 gallon tank is 125 gallons pretty self-explanatory the only thing I've done to this tank in the last week or so is a water change and I added some of that same plant. I put two bulbs in here, one here you can see, the other I kind of tucked in underneath of that rock there and I don't know if the bulb itself has been pulled up or if just the green has been munched off of the top of it and the bulb itself is still down. Uh, with the roots in the substrate we will have to wait and find out if it is just the greenery munched off it'll come back and I'll see some shoots coming out of that here in the fairly near future uh, another thing I did while I was in there you can see this piece of Anubius right here it's kind of gangly and you know just doesn't really look like it's hanging on well that had several little babies um, growing off of the main rhizome so I broke a few of them off and put them in a couple of my other tanks um, upstairs and I also put one of the little pieces I tucked it into the woodwork right there so hopefully that Anubius will root in and start growing and we'll actually have some more interesting growth coming off of the central um, piece of wood in this tank Here's a good look at one of my chocolate zebra plecos. If it'll focus on it. And someone asked me about my small loach the other day because they did not see it. They saw the two bigger ones, but not the small one. So there you go. There's the small one, the medium one, and then the big one is actually the one in the back lying underneath the power head. He likes lying back there underneath the power head. He spends a lot of time under there. I don't know if it's the flow of the water or the vibration or what, but the big loach likes to sit underneath that power head. And the clown loach that's in my garami tank actually likes to lay on top of the power head. I look in there all the time and for a moment I think it's, you know, uh, if you've got a power head in a tank like that, a lot of times if a fish dies you'll find it by it being stuck to the power head. Uh, and so when I see my other loach in my garami tank lying on top of the power head, my first thought is that I've got a dead fish stuck to the power head, but it's not. It's just in there uh, sleeping on it. So my 20-gallon tank that I'm calling my angelfish tank is a standard 20. It's not a 20 long or anything. And nothing really going on in here to speak of. It's still just kind of ticking over and doing its thing. I've got... two cherry barbs in there where are they there's the one and I can't find the other one oh there she is 
So I've got two female cherry barbs in here with the liar tail. And what I want is a male, or two males really, just to get some bright red color in there. I thought these were males when I got them, but it turns out that they're not. So that's the only thing I've really got going on in this tank is I'm trying to get a couple of male cherry barbs to go in here. I actually went to the pet store today looking for them and I wasn't unable to get any. So I did bring home some other fish that we'll have a look at in just a moment. So my two angel fish are still looking really good. This one looks fantastic. I love the way his fins got that pompadour look at the top. And then this one's turning out to be really attractive as well. I was hoping it was going to turn out to be sort of smoky and golden like that. And it is. So I'm really happy about that. So down here in my quarantine tank, I've got several hatchet fish. I've got six hatchet fish, all of which have been doing well for several days now. And that's unusual for me. I usually have very bad luck with hatchet fish. And in this case, I've added some of that poultry grit, crushed coral, and crushed oyster shells and I'm hoping that just by adding a little bit of mineral ions to the water it's going to help these fish uh, do well and now that I'm looking closely at them I can see one or two little white spots on one of their fins so it's possible that they might have ick so I think I'm going to begin treating this tank for ick just in case I also brought home yet another angel fish that you can see hiding back there and that angelfish is going to hopefully go in my wife's tank. I don't know why, but I've been having trouble keeping fish alive in there. I have a tank set up for her that I do all the maintenance and everything on. But I've been trying to get an angelfish in there for her. And every time I put one in there, it dies. Even if it's one that I've had going, you know, fine in my quarantine tank, within days of it going in that tank, angelfish are dead so I don't know what is going on with it there's nothing unusual about it the water is the same the, you know the substrate's the same I, I you know I, I'm just I'm puzzled by why I can't get an angelfish to take in there so we're going to try one more time and that angelfish back there is the possibly unlucky uh, test subject so moving on to my brackish tank here this one needs a water change and it needs the filter change. I just realized yesterday I've not changed the filter on this tank since I've set it up. It's a canister filter and it's sitting on the rack underneath of the stand. So it's going to be kind of difficult to wiggle out of there. It's a really tight fit and I've just always kind of put it off because it just seems like it's going to be a pain in the butt and I've never wanted to get around to it. So. That's all that's really going on with this tank. I don't have a lot more to talk about. Um, the holes in the plant here, I know we can hardly even see them. I didn't realize the front glass on this tank was so dirty. This is a very impromptu uh, around the world. But if you see all the little Swiss cheese holes on the uh, leaves, I've insisted that I don't think it's butter bean doing it because I just can't imagine a puffer punching little holes and biting holes in leaves of a plant. But I have a lot of people say that that's what it is. I've been sent forum threads where I've read conversations by people that are, you know, eyewitnesses. They, they watch their puffer doing it. Um, some people say it's because the puffer's biting at the little um, spores on the back of the ferns. Ferns are, are a very, very old plant. They're before flowers, so they breed by spores. And if you look at the underside or the backside of the leaves, you'll see rows of brown dots and those dots are the spores but to a puffer those brown dots could look like snails and if you look you'll see you know the holes go right down on a row on either side and that's right where the spores would be located so that is possible that it's confusing the snails with the spores it's also possible that the snails like the spores and maybe i've had snails in there and when he bites the snails off of the you know it's just coincidental that it's right where the spores are but i still have yet to witness it myself or see any behavior like that but i have been assured by quite a few people that it is indeed butterbean biting holes in those leaves which again i find really interesting i've had java fern with him before and this is something that's pretty recent i've never noticed this before um so i don't know other than that, nothing really going on in the tank. Everybody's ticking over nicely. Haven't lost anybody. Haven't added anybody. So we will move on to my final tank. 
and I'm happy to say as little as we're going to get to see of it, at least we can kind of see one of my crabs. If you see that little spot, see if I can get my finger in there right there, that little dark spot sticking out from above that rock is the female. The other day I saw two of them right around that same rock. So I don't know if it's two of them living side by side or if one was out and about and was just out saying hello to the neighbors. Uh, I did also notice that I've got, if you look at this gray rock right here, right where my finger, that little brownish thing sitting on the gravel right there, that is the shell of a crab. I don't think it got killed and destroyed I do believe it's sloughed so if we're getting sloughs then that means we've still got crabs in there growing and doing well so I know I keep saying it but one of these days I am going to do something else with this tank and, and get it up off the floor at least where we can see it a little better if you'll notice the last time we looked at this tank I had lots and lots of greenery in it it's all of the water sprite that I just pull out of this tank when I do my water changes and I just kind of drop it right in here and look how little is left in there so you can tell the crabs really go after that water sprite they really love it and me just dropping it in the tank serves as a good food source for them so i'm going to continue doing that and you know like i said one of these days maybe we'll get this sitting up on a little table somewhere or somewhere where we can appreciate it a little more so there you go that was a trip all the way around the world i was hoping to get this done in under half an hour and we just made it so i will say thanks for watching this one make sure you're subscribed you don't want to miss anything else i got coming up and, of course, don't forget this one here is my 29-gallon miscellaneous tank. So thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you real soon in the next one.